Hello, thank you for joining us for Slate School's webinar about careers in education, thinking outside of the box. We are thrilled to have all of you with us here today. My name is Jennifer Staple-Clark, and I'm part of a team working to create Slate School, which is a 501c3 nonprofit nature-based elementary school in North Haven, Connecticut. I will briefly introduce you to Slate School, review the webinar logistics, and then we will hear from our expert panelists. Slate School cultivates creativity, fosters ingenuity, and inspires a deep passion for lifelong learning and discovery. And Slate School's mission and priority is that each child's innate and natural love for learning be nurtured and enabled to grow and flourish. Slate School will be sited on 25 acres in North Haven, Connecticut, surrounded by natural resources including woods, meadows, and organic gardens. And Slate School will also cultivate a nature conservancy, preserving most of the land in its raw natural state. And the grounds will be free of pesticides and fertilizers, and all of the buildings will be free of formaldehydes, VOCs, and other toxic chemicals, so becoming one of the most environmentally friendly schools in the country. Now I will uh, briefly describe the logistics of this webinar. We are so delighted to have all of you with us here today. We have several incredible panelists, and they have a wealth of expertise to share with you during this next hour. Each of our panelists today will give a two-minute introduction about themselves, their current role, and their key guidance and advice about careers in education and thinking outside of the box. And then we will dedicate the remaining time to your questions and answers, and we received many stellar questions from you, our audience. And we selected some of the most thoughtful and common questions to ask our panelists. And we also encourage you to submit your own additional questions in the text box on the left of your webinar screen throughout this next hour. And then we'll select additional questions to ask the panelists as well. Now we will proceed with having our panelists introduce themselves. I'm delighted to introduce you to our first panelist, Jordan Levy. Jordan, please begin by introducing yourself, your background and current role, and please share your key guidance and lessons learned about a career in education and thinking outside of the box. Sure. Thank you, Jennifer. It's great to be a part of this. <clears throat> really excited and um, very honored to be on this uh, distinguished panel of educators some of whom I know I've met before and was really blown away by the insights I was able to take away in our previous meetings. Um, I'm the Chief External Relations Officer at what is now called Ubuntu Pathways, which is exciting for me to announce because this only occurred uh, last week, Friday, uh, that we officially changed our name from Ubuntu Education Fund, uh, which we've been called uh, for the last 18 years. Uh, my uh, experience uh, in the field dates back really to 2001 um, when I came on board with this organization um, in its very fledgling stages uh, and, and helped build the organization from what started out with uh, two people in a broom closet in a township in Port Elizabeth, South Africa, to an organization that works with thousands of children, taking them from cradle to career. And the reason we have chosen to call ourselves Ubuntu Pathways is because we believe each child has their own individualized pathway that needs to be nurtured every step of the way. Um, and, and that's really uh, one of the key lessons that I derived um, from my experience is this necessity and what we think about for our own children. And what I love about uh, Slate School is that it respects the fact that growing up is a long process that takes pretty much everything uh, every day, and it must be considered in a comprehensive and, and holistic way. And I think really what we have to respect is is the environment. We talk about nature, but the, the, the whole environment, the whole context really can contribute to learning even when there's negative elements to, to one's environment. And as teachers and educators, we really have to assess where we're teaching and how we're teaching and what we can utilize in our surroundings um, to really show lessons of both challenge uh, and opportunities, and I think um, the philosophy of Slate School reflects that, and I know that the philosophy of Ubuntu Education Fund is, is quite similar, so I'll, I'll stop there for now. Terrific. Thank you so much, Jordan. And Julie Mountcastle, if you can also please introduce yourself, your current role and background, and share your key guidance about our career in education. Of course, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm actually completely humbled to be to be a part of this. I'm, I'm so thrilled uh, about Slate School and its 
its potential here in North Haven. So I'll just tell you about myself. I'm a I'm a classroom teacher in a public school. I teach uh, in a mixed age classroom in a program called the Integrated Day Program, which is mixed age and project based. Um, it's been in my school for about 50 years. It came to us from England, and it was brought here by parents and teachers who wanted an alternative to a regular contemporary one grade per classroom situation. Uh, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful program. Uh, my journey is a little bit different because. Uh, until about uh, 18 years ago, I was a Broadway actress. I was in musical comedies on Broadway and in London and all across the country, and I loved that job. Um, but I've always been open uh, to changing my life, and I never said I would do anything forever. And so I was open. When I had children, I realized that teaching was something that I was I was I was really passionate about. And so I went back to school and got my degree, and I'm able now in my classroom um, to combine my love for the arts with my love for learning and education, because I really believe that the arts, um, and theater in particular, I am biased towards the theater, um, have have, have the ability to make learning both real and magical for kids. And I guess, you know, my best advice for future educators would be find out Find out by by thinking about about what makes you unique as a teacher and a learner. Develop that, understand that, and then be open to evolving, but not ever abandoning those talents to become something inauthentic. If there's one thing that I know about kids, is they can sense the authentic person in the room, and they will learn with them, and they will respect them, and you can learn with the kids as well. So um, I would just say, be the teacher you're meant to be. Be the teacher you're meant to be, and then collaborate with others. So I'll leave it there. Slate School does all that. I'm I'm sure it's going to do all that. So I'm very excited to be a part of this. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Julie. And our next panel is Cecily Wardell. Please introduce yourself and share your key guidance as well. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, for organizing this panel and <clears throat> inviting me to be part of it. I am, as, as everyone has said, uh, honored to be part of honored to be part of this group and this and this call today. Um, so, I my current role is director of operations of Birch's School, um, which is a school we with a lot of similarities to Slate School. I've been uh, hearing about you from different people at Birch's and, and reading about you online, and have been delighted um, by a lot of our shared philosophies. Um, we are in our sixth year of existence. I'm also one of the co-founders of the school. Um, and so we it was um, 2012 and a friend and I were, were looking for a school. We both had um, we both had children. Uh, one she had a first grader, I had a rising kindergartner, and what we were really looking for was a, a nature based school where the learning was project based, interdisciplinary, um, somewhat student-driven, but not entirely student-driven, so a, a hybrid there so that students felt that they had ownership in what they were learning and doing, um, but at the same time, we're still, you know, the teachers could, could foster and, and, and excite something. Um, I, always, I always say that how could a student know that they were fascinated by Thailand if they didn't know that Thailand existed? Um, so this kind of um, uh, collaboration between teachers and students, um, and then also the collaboration that has grown at our school between all the teachers um, as they seek to really discover um, how how to how to best reach these these students. I think I also was looking for an academically rigorous environment and a with a very strong social emotional component. Um, so the the long and short of it is I couldn't quite find this. We, neither of us could quite find this, despite a, a, there are a great many wonderful schools in Boston, but we didn't quite find what we we're looking for, so we asked um, the boys preschool if they would consider adding um, a kindergarten or a first grade, and instead suggested that they that we start our own school, um, and even uh, said they were moving out of their educational use space uh, in nine months, and it would be available to be leased by us. So this was obviously um, not a career that I had set out to embark on, but we 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 found the right people and um, from board of directors to truly brilliant teachers, um, and took it from there. So I think uh, my my greatest advice uh, or lesson would be would be to ask to ask questions. I think that I have been humbled this whole process by 
despite having a varied background, including some education background, I did not know enough to um, to do this without asking all the questions and building the collaborate collaborations and relationships that we did over time. Um, and so I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much. And Anna McCullough, uh, we are having difficulty getting her on the line, so we'll proceed for now with our three incredible panelists. And as you heard, they all have a wealth of expertise and guidance to share with you today. Now I'll proceed with the question and answer session. And as mentioned, we received questions in advance from you, our audience members, but we encourage you to submit additional questions in the text box on the left of your screen, and we'll pull questions from there as well. Our first question for Julie, how can teachers be creative with their curriculum despite standardized packaged curriculum? Well, we all have standardized packaged curriculum in the public school, and we do sometimes struggle to be creative with that. But uh, as I said sort of in the beginning, my, if you know who you are as a person and as a teacher, if you know what your gift is, if you know if you know what your gift is, then you can often find ways to make that gift visible through the work you do, even with boxed curriculum. I'm, I'm actually in a, in a very good situation where I still have quite a bit of student choice, and my, my program is project-driven for the most part, although it does exist alongside that boxed curriculum and with um, the, the looming standardized testing as well. But I do have the opportunity for my students to explore topics that they're interested in. And I thought Cecily said such a wonderful thing about they can't know that they're in love with Thailand unless they know that Thailand is there. So there is a lot of information and a lot of teaching that we do to give students a wide uh, basis of knowledge. But then we do let them choose their own projects. And so for me, that's where the creativity comes through because I'm allowed to um, encourage kids and help them along the path of learning what they're passionate about. And I find that they always raise their skills to meet whatever challenges, to be able to study more and more about the things they're passionate about. So you can be creative and you can find ways to give students choice in the day. Because in the end, it's that student choice that I think motivates them and makes the whole room really buzz with the excitement of learning. So I think that's what I'd say to that question. It's possible. It's doable. Great. Thank you so much, Julie. And Cecily, how can schools prepare their own curriculum instead of relying on standardized packaged curriculum? And how can you determine and evaluate outcomes when a school prepares its own curriculum? Yes, yeah, so um, I I think that for me the key here is Birches, virtually everything that we teach at Birches is um, is derived by our teachers. So it is we we use very very little um, prepackaged curriculum. There is the kindergartners and first graders do 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 handwriting without tears because we found that just a bit of the handwriting in the day that was that was very helpful, but. Overall, everything is written by our teachers, um, and I have been struck from day one at how um, how brilliant these teachers are. How they can integrate um, we how they can integrate the learning and the abilities and the desires um, uh, of the of students across K through we have K through seventh grade right now. Um, and while we the whole school can be learning can be in one unit, um, and yet they can meet each child where they are and then help them to take the next step and help them to score from there. So um, in this, the, the, the first answer is to hire the right teachers, um, which I could never do what they, what they do, but I know how to find them. Um, and they are few and far between, but they are, um, well, I, I'm not sure they're few and far between. I think that they have to have a level of um, desire and passion to do this. I think some of, I often tell my teachers to go to sleep instead of working in their Google documents at midnight. Um, and I know their uh, spouses or significant others <laughs> tell them that as well. Um, so I think that um, that finding the people, as I said in the beginning, asking questions, I think finding the teachers who are passionate about this, who want to do this, and who have, who have some experience um, doing this is the, first, um, is the first step. And I think that, um, for example, it helps us at our school having one unit across all of the grades at one time. And that's, this is not always true, but it's often true. So, um, 
the unit right now, for example, is ocean, but the one before um, that was, well, the one, the, not last year, it was neuroscience. And so, and I think the teachers are also very passionate about what they're doing. And so, for example, uh, when they were doing neuroscience, they did it right from K and up, and they integrated, um, of course, the science aspects of it, but they also, um, reading and writing and the read aloud books and everything they were doing connected, even our nature walks, they connected that to pathways through the brain. Um, and I was totally impressed by how they were able to, you know, the kindergartners would come home and talk about, um, motor neurons and then, and then the sixth and seventh graders were doing the same learning, but on a whole different scale and plane. And it was, you know, it's fascinating to watch. And then of course, how excited the students are. In terms of um, evaluating outcomes, again, it's, um, you know, I'm, my hats are always off to the brilliant teachers who somehow or other can know where each child is in his or her classroom at all times and could do a formal, could do a full assessment on each student in that. Um, um, and so, and I think that they do then do a lot of, um, they do have some more, you know, in, in the K and ones, they will take sort of typical phonics um, and spelling and reading evaluate assessments and apply them to the students just to see where they are. But it's also a lot of portfolio-based um, assessments. We have um, the journal pages for the little ones, and of course, and all the body of work um, for the older ones that that can always be be assessed. Um, and I think in I think as particularly as the older grades. Um, they work backwards a bit. So before the teachers design a unit, um, they decide what the rubric is that they are hoping each student can meet, um, and then design design a big project from from that back end. And I think that certainly allows them to be sure that students are meeting milestones and help the students need extra help or provide extensions for the students who are ready for more. Excellent. Thank you so much. And a follow-up question: uh, What is your process to find the right teachers for a school? Huh. Um, so we advertise. So some of it is some of it is word of mouth, um, and so and then some of it is luck. Um, one of our uh, our second teacher, who we call the dean of academics, colloquially you know, as, around our school, was actually um, she has a little girl the same age as mine, and we were in a little girls' play group. She had just moved up to Boston, um, and for her husband's work, um, and was planning on taking a year off. Uh, from teaching, we had come out of 14 years of a very similar the sim school with very similar ideals to um, to Birch's and um, to the Slate School as well. And I met her at a little um, at a you know a, you know parent and baby group um, and talked to her for about five minutes and invited her over for a play date the next day and hired her two hours later. So there is some luck. Um, then there's also we word of mouth advertising, you know, network community asking people if they know anybody who's passionate about this kind of uh, job. And we do post online as well on the Asian site, and um, and and you can you get to know people through all those different methods. Fantastic! Thank and, you so much. And Jordan, looking back at your career, what do you wish that you could tell yourself as an early professional? Uh, yeah, I mean, so, so many things uh, can be learned over, you know, the course of, of 20 years or so, so there, there's a lot. But at the end of the day, some of the core lessons are, for example, don't don't try to solve everything. Um, it's, it's about participating, learning, and contributing. Uh, and, and when you do that, you will come to some solutions and, and some best practices. But as a young professional, often there's an urgency within you and, and from without, or at least perceived to be from without, that there's this great pressure uh, that, that we have to solve these, these big problems. And as you go along in your career, whether you're building a school or building an organization similar to the one uh, I worked on, or uh, whether you're raising children, or, or so many different uh, efforts in life, they're long-term. They're not overnight problems to be solved. And I think we do this uh, to children as much as we do the, to, to ourselves. I would give the same advice to my 6-year-old and my 4-year-old and their approach 
uh, to their to their academic lives as they get older, um, as I would to a young professional in, in my organization. Don't put too much pressure on yourself because although we read on the internet every day these hacks about how people have solved problems, uh, it, it's it's if it sounds like it's too good to be true, it's it's too good to be true. These things are not solved overnight, and, and uh, overnight. And, and to be practical about it, you can look at it from a uh, organizational building um, uh, point of view, where you talk about HR issues, where you talk about hiring, which you were speaking about a little bit earlier. You talk about retention. You talk about people becoming good at their jobs, uh, whether you're a teacher or a, a lawyer or a development professional or whatever you do. Not many people become very good at it in a year or two years. Uh, it, it takes many, many years to learn the right lessons, and you have to go through actual failures uh, to learn it. And uh, whether it's looking at it from the professional point of view or a child or a family's journey. Um, as I've worked in, in these poor townships in South Africa, I watched uh, as, as young people who I met when they were uh, 10 years old, 12 years old, uh, grew up in front of my eyes. And there were times along their journey, especially when they were teenagers, where I, where I would see people kind of getting off of their path and I would be very frustrated and very concerned for these young people. I'm thinking of uh, one girl in particular who was such a promising, um, incredible young woman who lived a very uh, difficult life uh, facing the incredible challenges of immense poverty, uh, who we basically lost touch with at one point, uh, even though she was somebody I thought was such a success story. Uh, and we were so worried and we were so concerned and we thought, you know, if we can't get her back on track tomorrow, um, there, there's not going to be uh, a success story there. But it took her time to come to terms with the issues that she needed to come to, and it took her time to appreciate the resource she had in uh, our organization, but it's the same way with schools often. Um, she had to find the maturity, and it, it took her years to do that. Um, so generally, I think as young people, we apply a lot of pressure on ourselves, and I think you know, as we get older and we look at um, young people, we, we apply unrealistic standards and we remember things probably differently than they occurred. Um, we look at our cycles of how we learn things and we condense them because in our minds uh, things are skipped and some of the hard times are forgotten. And we think, oh, yeah, I uh, took on this challenge and I solved it. And we have this formula of how we solved it. But if we really go back and remember the details of how we solved it, there was often many failures in between that starting point and the quote-unquote solution. Um, so I just encourage us to, to, whether we're talking to our younger selves, whether we're talking to our children, whether we're talking to young professionals coming up in, in any sector, but of course education, young teachers, uh, don't put too much pressure to, to solve everything at once. Allow time for mistakes. And remember that those ca that came before you, even those who you respect immensely, uh, made made critical errors and 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 often failed. And if we remember that, I think we'll be better educators uh, and better professionals. Wonderful, thank you, Jordan. And a related question: What do you suggest to ensure that one enjoys the journey, not the destination, in their career? Well, it's, yeah, it's a similar it's a it's it's a similar thing, but I think um, uh, adding on to that, uh, it's about the people around you. Um, if you are where you should be, I, I think often you will enjoy those working next to you and, of course, um, those that may be your teaching or uh, assisting. But, you know, often your colleagues um, along the journey are the absolute secret to in enjoying that journey, and you have to have a sense of humor uh, about what you're doing, what you're doing, and especially about yourself. Um, and and don't take uh, even even your uh, state admission too seriously in the sense that there can be no deviation from it. Uh, don't become completely um, ideological in in how you approach uh, education or any form of um, development recognize that there will be uh, shifts along the way and if 
if if you and the group of people that you're working most closely with have that freedom and flexibility um, and really learn how to laugh along the way, even in the face of, of you know, sometimes what can be considered really, uh, I mean, tragedy sometimes and, and, and major challenges, especially, you know, when you're working in a resource-poor area or when you're just working with children in general, you're going to face times uh, where you feel that a child is, is uh, not progressing or is on the wrong track and there could be serious consequences. And these are hard things to remain positive about, but you have to step back and look at the bigger picture. You have to um, have some kind of work-life balance, and you, you have to work with a group of people who are going to uh, allow you to do that, and, and you have to give them the same freedom. And if you create that group around you, you'll find that you have an incredible buffer when things truly do get uh, tense. And then when, when things are great, you, you have people to celebrate with, and that's equally as important. Um, celebrating your successes and really enjoying those successes and taking a time to appreciate them is, is absolutely essential. Excellent. Thank you, Jordan. And, Julie, what has been most fulfilling in your career, and how do you ensure that you remain passionate about your work on a daily basis? Well, I I think um, one of the things that's been the most fulfilling is, is kind of realizing that I'm not just the teacher when I'm standing at the front of the class. I am the teacher when I'm working beside the student, when I'm making mistakes, when I'm regrouping, when I'm trying again. Uh, I am there full-size model, right? And um, it, it's been wonderful for me to see kids understand that and and see them, um, you know, kids are increasingly stressed out these days. They feel increased pressure to perform, to perform. And uh, I find that um, their fear of failing often impedes them from succeeding. And that's you know, coming from parents and it's coming from, you know, very competitive environment and they're really afraid to make mistakes. And uh, so in the classroom, being able to model um, making mistakes and regrouping and um, having dramatic uh, new understandings and changing my thinking and um, just being motivated, not by some arbitrary line on a scale that says I'm a success, but being motivated by wanting to learn more, wanting to be better, wanting to do a better job as a person. Um, when I see that in my students, and I'm so fortunate to see it almost every day, I feel uh, incredibly thrilled. And it's a predictable miracle, but it's still a miracle every time I see it. And uh, there's nothing more fulfilling and um uh, Knowing the next moment like that is out there, it keeps me passionate about my work, and it keeps me sitting beside the students instead of just standing up at the front of the classroom all by myself. So I would say that's it for me. Fantastic. Thank you, Julie. And Cecily, what are your suggestions for charting one's own path to make an impact on education? Hmm. Um, I think... I think that I, I would say um, being open to possibilities. I think that if one is, um, as with as as with students, um, if one is stressed or worried or wanting to stick just to the prescribed path, the typical path, um, then sometimes you can miss opportunities and possibilities that are more exciting than anything you could have even imagined if you set out to um, to chart your, your career before it started. Um, so I think that um, – I think being open to what what might happen, what could happen, being open to um, to dreaming about the possibilities, um, and, and speaking with – and I, I, I may say this over and over again, but I also think speaking with um, people who have – done different things, done things you might not even consider, but that you can ask ask questions of uh, and be open to. Um, and I think being open to to collaborations, learning things, uh, learning about more about um, what it is to work in education from other educators, from people who don't 
even necessarily work in education but are passionate about it. Um, one of our big breakthroughs at, at Birch's came when we developed a formal collaboration with the Lincoln Land Trust, um, which is a and, – and this collaboration is probably the first of its kind in the country and I know has enriched both – has enriched our students' lives, our teachers' lives, the administration's lives, and, and those who are involved in the Land Trust. We collaborate with them on – curriculum, uh, curricular projects, and they helped us find the land that we will soon call our permanent home, um, as well as conserve some land. And so I think if, if we at Birch's hadn't been, um, cultivating friendships and, and getting to know the people in the community, as well as being open to truly different and new possibilities, this, this would never have come about. Um, so I think, think being open, um, listening, asking questions, um, and always and, and considering things that might seem very unusual um, as, as, a, as, a, as a possible path. Great. Thank you so much. And now a question actually for all of the panelists, and perhaps we can start with Jordan. Looking back, what was the most important decision that you made which led to where you are today? How did you come to that decision, and would you change anything about that inflection point? Um, there, there were a number of, of key decisions along the way, but I think um, going down to volunteer, uh, as I did in, in 2003 uh, for Ubuntu, thinking I was going to stay six months and ending up uh, staying in South Africa 11 years and with the organization uh, over 15 years, uh, certainly was a, a major decision um, in in my life, and and the real decision though was was committing to something that I had a passion for, um, and that really uh, has been the, the most important decision I've I've made in in my life uh, as to what to work for, and uh, knowing uh, the other panelists on the call, and I'm sure many who are listening. Uh, it's a similar um, similar situation uh, where uh, when the choices came in life, there were options of what to seek as a as a priority. Um, you know, whether it be uh, money or a certain type of career or a certain stability, um, and that wasn't necessarily the thing that that drove us to make the decisions we made. For me personally, it was um, looking at a choice that uh, a friend of mine had, had made and, and uh, realizing that while it was unconventional, uh, it, was a, um, it was a really important choice for him and something that I uh, could feel viscerally. And I've spoken about it before as a, as a gift um, this idea of Ubuntu, as we talk about it, is, is about uh, human as a human through other people and uh, having that human connection and deciding that um, my life's work would be about that human connection was, uh, was an extremely important uh, choice for me. And, and I don't want to over uh, glorify it in the sense that I've never uh, <laughs> looked at it and, and uh, wondered if I made the right choice. At times, of course, of course I have. Um, there are other competing uh, human needs, um, and there are other selfish desires that we all have, and, and it, it, it serves nobody to deny that we all um, have yearnings for those things. But at the same time, in the end, in the long term, I'm absolutely positive that I made the right choice. Uh, and, and I do think that uh, if I hadn't made that choice, on some level, I would have had to deal with always wondering, what life would be like if if I had made a similar choice, um, and I do know a lot of people who, as they reach uh, the age I'm at, uh, start to wonder more and more a, about those types of things, and and it's something that I feel uh, very confident in and, and very excited about, and I think that uh, it, it definitely taught me um, important lessons about what it what it takes. Uh, to, to maybe make change in the world and, and it, it, it certainly humbled me because although I've dedicated my life 
to this, uh, there's been so many times where uh, even with all the effort and all the focus, uh, it, it still seemed I- I- impossible. Um, so I think I think it's a learning experience, and I, and I think not having made this choice, I may not have had the knowledge that I have um, and the experience that I have, which is is what I treasure most. Wonderful, thank you, Jordan. And Julie, if you can also share what your most important decision was, and if you would change anything about that inflection point. Well, I I can definitely uh, say what the what the point was when I when I made the decision because I I remember distinctly I was um, I was actually sitting in my dressing room. I, my lifelong desire had been to be on Broadway. And um, I worked very hard to get to that point. I was very fortunate. I had a lot of wonderful jobs, and I, I worked with many wonderful people all over the country and in London. And, and I was sitting in my dressing room. I was in a Broadway show, and I had a young child at home. And I looked around, and everybody was happy but me because I wanted to put my child to bed. And I had a hunch that I was supposed to be doing something more important than um, than the show I was going to do that night. Um, I loved being an actress. It was a wonderful job, and I, 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 I think it's an important job, too. I do, because I think we all need our spirits lifted, and I think that the theater can entertain and educate us and help us see our own personal faults and foibles in ways that are less painful but still insightful. So I think it's a very important art form, and I'm thrilled that other people are doing it. But for me, I realized that the gift that had been brewing in me as a teacher, um, I, I was doing a lot of master classes in the theater, uh, was calling me uh to go to the classroom and be with children on a full-time basis. And um, I wouldn't change that point because it was so clear to me at that moment that my life needed to take that turn. And I'm, I'm happy that I was open to that change. And I think that that's the, the biggest thing for me is that I remain open. Um, I love teaching. I love being with my students. Uh, I, think it's a, I think it's a wonderful profession. But I'm still growing and learning, I hope. And I'm still uh, always looking for ways that I, can, um, that I can make a bigger impact or that I can do things that bring out my talents even further. And so um, I, I'm happy where I am, but I think the most important thing, you know, for all of the young people that might be listening is to be open for the callings as they come. Life is not one thing. Your career journey is is not a straight line. It's not straight up. It's 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 not even uh, slightly jagged in my experience. <laughs> and um, uh, I I think it's important that we stay open to new possibilities and um, always looking for the way we can be the biggest light in the world. Excellent. Thank you, Julie. And Cecily, if you can also please share your thoughts on this question about that most important decision. Yes, I think um, one most important decision would have been when, um, so this my co-founder and I walked into a meeting with the, pre, the head of the preschool, and we had laid out all the reasons why we thought that it would be beneficial both for the preschool and for the students to add a couple of grades, and we really were totally clear on what we were hoping for. Um, and then a bit out of left field, the um, the head of the preschool uh, said that that wasn't an option, but but we should do it ourselves. And I think, you know, at first, at, I think I, I remember so clearly walking out of that meeting and, and, and thinking, this is not at all what I envisioned ever in a million years. Um, I, I never, I, I certainly uh, very much enjoyed um, helping organizations grow and building organizations in different points in my life, but I, I had never... I was I was daunted uh, at the idea of taking on a whole school um, and you know and and on some level and starting something where we really uh, one of the most important things that a, a person can do is to help um, young young people grow and develop and thrive and, and that's the point of a school and certainly took that as very seriously and 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 very much um, that wasn't an easy decision in the sense that I think it was it was daunting it was scary it wasn't even the right thing 
to do? Did, did Boston need another school? Um, and I think, um, but I think ultimately, um, the, the thought that we really could make a difference, have an impact, do something that wasn't being done, um, was, was, was very powerful. And I, I certainly never regret the decision. There's been moments, um, when, you know, it, there's always moments where things are, are tough and you, and you wonder if you've done the right thing. But I think, um, I think that I wouldn't change a thing because, um, that night I, that, because, because of all of the impact we've had on, on, on the students, the, the kids who come to school and, you know, and smile and can't wait to run into school. And when they leave school in the afternoon, tell their parents excitedly about everything that they did and their, you know, that an archaeologist comes to school and, and suddenly half the school wants to be an archaeologist and, you know, a, um, or a silk moth, um, professor comes and gives a lecture when we were doing the silk road and, you know, and then half of, half of the school again goes home and tells their parents they want to be a, um, a study silk moths and, and silk when they grow up. And, and of course, as, as children are, as children go, this will all change. But I think the idea that, um, that we can bring these experiences to the, to the students and seeing, um, just seeing how happy they are, how sad, they, amazingly how sad they are when summer rolls around for many of them, uh, wishing that school could keep going. You know, that means that that always says to me that I, I never, never regret anything I did. I remember that night going home and, and reading. I, I love Robert Frost. Um, and I went home that night and read one of my favorite poems, which is the Birches poem by Robert Frost. Um, and it talks about the swinger of birches and reaching up high. Um, and yet also coming down to earth. And it's a, it's a beautiful poem. And that's when, um, that's when I knew that, that we should call our school birches. And, um, and that certainly, I remember exactly the spot I was sitting in, uh, when I decided to, to, to go for it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'm thrilled that we now have our fourth panelist. Anna McCullough has joined our panel as well. So Anna, if you can, if we can step, take a step back just slightly, Anna, if you can introduce yourself, your current role, and your key guidance re and lessons learned regarding a career in education and thinking outside of the box. And then if you can also answer the same question that we've been asking all of the panelists, looking back, what was the most important decision that you made which led you to where you are today? How did you come to that decision, and would you change anything about that inflection point? And welcome, Anna. We're thrilled to have you on. Great. Thank you. And my sincere apologies for the delay in joining you all. Thank you for your understanding. And it is such an honor to be on this panel with so many wonderful um, innovators. So thank you for including me. Um, my name is Anna McCullough. I am the co-founder and CEO of QuestBridge, which is a national nonprofit organization that supports high-achieving, low-income students from all over the country. And through an online application, we connect our students to 39 of the most um, exceptional colleges in the country. And if they get in through QuestBridge, they get in on a full scholarship or a nearly full scholarship. Um, today, we have about 7,000 QuestBridge scholars attending our partner colleges throughout the country. And we're very excited to, um, to be supporting them through college and, and into their early careers. Um, I got into this work a little bit accidentally. I started doing a small summer program as an undergraduate um, way back uh, over 20 years ago now at Stanford. And a colleague and I, or classmate and I, really um, formed just a small summer program that we ended up spending a lot of time with our students. And, and they were high school kids, and we supported them into college. And at that time, we were working with 20 students at a time. Um, and then uh, after about 10 years of doing that, we realized that all of these amazing schools in our, in our country actually were looking for just the types of students that we were working with in QuestBridge. So we, we realized, and especially because at that time we had many thousands of applications for a small number of spots, um, both at our summer program at Stanford and eventually at Harvard, that, um, that we had this amazing applicant pool that we could share with a number of really great colleges that would welcome them and would want them to be successful on those campuses and also would be willing to provide financial aid. So at that time, again, about 10 years after we started the small summer program, we ended up sort of opening our pool up to multiple schools. And um, over the course of time, we now have 39 partner schools, as I said, and we placed last year over 2,000, about 2,500 students into those schools. So we went from pretty small to um, to quite a bit larger. And we're, again, we're very proud to be partners with our schools, including Yale um, and 
Princeton and MIT and Columbia and Swarthmore and a number of very other very wonderful colleges. Um, in terms of the sort of most important um, decisions that I've made in, in the work, I think that one of the things I learned so much was just, first of all, um, starting with a small idea, you can actually carefully and, and, and I think intentionally grow it um, and then, but, but as we were growing QuestBridge, we were really paying attention and trying to pay attention to what the true value was that we were bringing to the table. So while we had this really special summer program that we all loved, we also realized over the course of the years, we started one of our most important, um, you know, one of the most important things we could bring to society was, was the connection between this really significant, large, and talented applicant pool and these institutions that were really looking for them. And so while we kind of at one point thought that our program was really our summer program, we, we decided we would think bigger and really look around and see what is it that, that we can do with what we've created um, to make a bigger impact. And we didn't really realize that right under our noses was this wonderful applicant pool that, that we had sort of been thinking about um, the program but the, and, and the applicants were a little bit, um, you know, just a part of that, but we realized the applicant pool itself was was a powerful uh, group and, and a group that, that really needed to be connected to all these great resources. So I would say that um, for me, you know, what, what I um, learned was that sometimes, you know, strengths and, and assets are, are under your nose when you don't even realize it. And if you can stop and think about that for a little while, especially as you want to grow an organization, um, to kind of think very openly and, and differently about um, about what you're doing, because it could be that, that you have a lot already there in front of you, that if you just turn it a little bit in one direction, you can see it a whole different way, and then you can potentially um, make a bigger impact than, than you ever thought you could when you started. Excellent. Thank you, Anna. And a question both for Jordan and for Cecily, and perhaps Cecily, you can start off. Uh, what should an individual or team do as a first step to determine if they should start a new school or educational organization? And how should people avoid starting a school or organization for the sake of creating something new? I, that's a, it's a really good question. Um, I think that, I think that the first thing to, to think about is, um, is why why you want to start that to be very kind of to be very honest and open yourself with yourself or with the team about why you're starting it, um, what you hope to accomplish, um, and why something similar or close enough doesn't already exist. And and I think to think in a very thoughtful way of um, does it make more sense to join to join forces with somebody who's already doing something something very similar. Um, and I think that if um, I think that if the team decides the team really looks at everything all the, the sort of different similar but different um options available and um and and feels that that really they they can add something not just to not just to sort of survive but they can add something to the broader conversation um of education they can they can bring value to the students enrolled but also the teachers involved the wider community and you know even um even possibly you know even the wider the more the, the much more wider wide community we certainly um share our ideas and curriculum um with other with students looking to start or people looking to start schools or or existing schools um or even people looking to put some of our ideas into practice and so i think i think that um that having a a thoughtful conversation um, about, you know, what you're doing, why you're doing it, and, and, and what value one can add um, in addition to all the wonderful programs that are already out there is, is probably the best first way to start. Great. Thank you. And, Jordan, if you can add your additional thoughts, that would be wonderful. Sure. Well, I, I think that was very well answered, and um, I don't know that I have a, a, a ton more to add to, to that answer. Um, but I think it is a very practical question in its um, essence in the sense that you, you kind of want to do a needs analysis um, and, and understand what exactly is the <clears throat> problem or the gap 
the problem that you're, you're solving or, or the gap that you're filling, and, and that's uh, probably the most important thing. You may not, I think, you know, you don't have to have the full solution, um, as I referenced in my earlier answer, when you start out. I don't think that's the most important thing. Um, you, you may just have an idea that you want to uh, try to test out and, and see if it works, but the more important thing is, are you actually, as was articulated previously, are you actually filling a need? Are you um, filling a, a gap, or are you doing something that is either redundant or unnecessary? And I think um, there are some best practices in terms of needs analysis um, and, and really surveying the community that you're uh, in, um, and hopefully you understand that community and you understand its needs before you you kind of start to try to solve um, the, the problems. And I think the best thing that you can do is really ask the community itself um, what is needed and, and, and not um, kind of sometimes what I think happens, one of the mistakes that is made is, there's an external solution that, that's posited somewhere, uh, and it becomes a model of some sort. Uh, and then there's a thought process that this model is therefore replicable uh, and can be taken into any context. And I don't find that models often can be transposed onto to just a variety of contexts. I think it's really about the community needs and, and understanding the community first, and then maybe going and, and seeking the model. Excellent. Thank you, Jordan. And a question, uh, both Julie and Cecily should be able to provide some great insight in a variety of ways on this. What are your suggestions for applying for teaching positions, and how do you ensure that you stand out? And perhaps, Julie, you can share your thoughts first. Well, I, I think I, I think I said earlier, and, and maybe too many times, that um, the most important the most important thing you can do for yourself as an educator is to find out what you um, what what you what you bring that is unique. Um, what is it about you yourself as a as an educator and as a person that you can share with others that can motivate them and 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 help them to learn? So once you've identified that, then uh, you're going to lead with that because that's the way you that's the way you view the world. That's the way you that's your lens. And I think um, when you recognize that for yourself, then you also begin even more to appreciate the lenses of all the people around you, and you're a more open and, and, and willing collaborator. You're appreciating the talents of, uh, you know, the person in the neighboring classroom or the neighboring town or the town across the world, and um, you're working with them. And that is very appealing uh, um, to hiring to people who are hiring. Um, they're looking for someone who is going to be a part of a team and who can work well with others. So I think understanding yourself will help you to view others with greater respect and work better with them. And um, I, think that, I think that if you can do that and if you can make that clear in an interview process or in your materials as you write for jobs, I think that um, you'll have more offers than – then you can handle. And then the challenge will be for you to choose the school um, or the situation um, that you feel will most value your particular contribution. I would always guard against um, trying to make yourself into what somebody else seems to be looking for. Um, that's never a comfortable fit. It's like a, it's like a shoe, a half size too small. You can wear it for a while, but uh, it'll cripple you and you won't be able to share the gifts that you were innately given. So be authentic and respect the contributions of others, and um, you'll make yourself a, a very valuable package. Fantastic. Thank you, Julie. And Cecily, do you have additional thoughts on that question? Sure. So the way that um, teachers stand out to us um, at at Birch's is, um, as I think, Birch's and also Slate certainly has a, and, and many wonderful organizations have a slightly different or view on education that is, that is progressive, that is um, trying to, trying to certainly solve, as we were talking about this niche issue in a, in a certain kind of way. So, 
the teachers who stand out to us are the teachers who have done their research, who have um, read our website, perhaps asked questions, perhaps um, somehow it depends. It obviously depends how this happens. If, if these are um, if this, if a teacher is coming to us through word of mouth, um, then teachers who ask questions um, of the mutual the mutual acquaintance, the mutual um, uh, connecting connection person, I guess to say is is says a lot. I think the teachers who understand what we are doing and then um, authentically, um, as was very well put, want to be part of that are the ones who stand out to us. So being sure that what we do is also where their passion lies um, and then showing us that that is what their, that, that, that is what their passion is. Um, but also in addition, we, we look for people who can bring something else to the table. So certainly understanding what we understanding what we do, how we do it, um, but then who can bring their own unique perspective, can maybe bring, we, as mentioned, we're very collaborative, so the teachers all work together. Their collaborative nature, I think, fuels a lot of the wonderful aspects of the school, and so we're always looking for someone who can come in and with a slightly different perspective and teach us all something new. I think we all edu- um administration, faculty, students, um, we all are always seeking to learn every day. So somebody who can come in and, and teach us all something new is something we, is, we, is highly, highly valued. Um, and the obvious, um, the obvious things being articulate in the cover letter, um, a resume that makes sense, um, that we've got, I've, you know, I'm sure all educators have gotten the resumes that, that aren't, you know, they're out of typos, that sort of thing. I mean, that's the basic stuff. Um, and then, somehow letting letting who you are as a teacher and a person shine through what understanding what we do and also helping to to show us what we how we might be able to do what we're doing better or with a different point of view that could enhance um, the educational experience for the children. Great. Thank you so much, Cecily. And Anna, how has your organization evolved over time? What were some of the greatest barriers that you encountered and how did you overcome them? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I would say our, our organization evolved um, in some fundamental ways, even in terms of just the number of students who are serving, the, um, the the size of our staff. But but also I would say that um, that fundamentally it still feels like the same organization from the standpoint of the DNA of who we are and, and our values and our mission. So that's been fun to see over the years, the sort of consistency in that sense. But in terms of the barriers we've we've experienced, I would say that probably, um, you know, something that's typical of organizations as old as we are, we're, we're over 20 years old at this point, um, that, that, you know, kind of continuing to try to evolve and, and grow and to keep up with, you know, what the world is, is sort of offering in terms of opportunity. And then, of course, you know, from a funding perspective, just, just really trying to be aware, certainly in our early days, being very conscious and aware of, of money and how that, um, that enables things, but it also should not be the, you know, the, um, the determinant of some of our, you know, most important core values. So how do you balance, you know, the, 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 the need to, to make sure that you can sustain the operation while always making sure that you're, you're keeping true to your mission and, and your students and what really matters to you. I think those things were very prominent in the early days. And then as we've gotten sort of further into our history and, and to today, now we're, we're in the very fortunate position to have lots of different possibilities for growth and, and directions we could take. So again, trying to really maintain and, and be true to our mission and, and not do mission creep. You know, I think that's always a temptation when you get to this point. So, um, so we still we still wrestle with that, but we try to be very honest and very true to what you know what we're here to do. Um, so, so for the most part, we feel very fortunate and lucky. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anna, and thank you to all of our phenomenal panelists and for all of the insight that you shared with our webinar audience today. This brings us to the conclusion of today's webinar. Thank you.